Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at the Listening Post. This week, the Levison Report. Where does British journalism go from here? And where does this leave the Cameron government? It has been the most public and the most concentrated look at the press that this country has seen. Memo to Beijing. The Onion is not a real news website, and Kim Jong-un is not that sexy. Journalism in black and white. The newsroom is the heart of a newspaper. The way things used to be. And Mohamed Morsi gets the Mubarak treatment online in our web video of the week. The British newspaper industry, the raucous, unbridled, and often outrageous tabloid culture that produced the phone hacking scandal at Rupert Murdoch's News of the World, may never be the same. That's if the recommendations made by Brian Levison, the judge who headed the inquiry into the press and politics in the UK, are acted upon. Levison wants the government to draw up Britain's first press law since the 17th century and create a new independent body to regulate newspapers, one that, unlike the current Press Complaints Commission, actually has some teeth. The lobbying over the report, which began before it was made public, has now moved into overdrive. Prime Minister David Cameron, whose own cozy relationship with the Murdoch-owned press was revealed by the inquiry that he himself called for, now seems to be siding with the media moguls who don't want the new press rules enshrined in law, and that could well test the relationship that Cameron has with the coalition partner his Conservative Party needs to maintain its grip on power. This is a story with political implications. Our starting point this week is London, a global media capital whose own print media may soon be operating under a brand new set of rules. What's at stake with the Leveson Report is about our democracy. The Leveson Report has damned the press and divided the politicians. Because this is a debate about who gets to speak, how they get to speak, what are the nature of the sources, what are the nature of the relationships between the powerful politicians and the press. This is incredibly important for the future of our democracy. After six months of hearings, 184 witnesses, 42 more written submissions, and some of the dirtiest laundry ever aired before a British public, the results of the Levison inquiry are in. Justice Levison says self-regulation did not work, that some grotesque examples of phone hacking are proof of that, and that a new independent regulator is needed, bolstered by a new law. Guaranteed independence, long-term stability, and genuine benefits for the industry cannot be realized without legislation. Prime Minister Cameron agrees that self-regulation didn't work, but doesn't like the idea of statutory regulation, a new press law. In the opinion of the newspapers, generally speaking, it leads you on a slippery slope where inevitably the people in power, the politicians, the judges, they start to use that legal power. Sometimes, in the worst examples, to lock journalists up, but even more mildly, to threaten and cajole uh, those journalists so they'll be better behaved. A lot of this is about a scare story. There has been a systematic press campaign, ironically, at the heart of the press, in a demonstration of press power to try and taint any calls for more robust regulation as a form of regulating content. I really don't see that those complaints are based in any kind of sensible, rational uh, reading of the situation. But if it's underpinned by statute, they say hysterically, this is the end of freedom as we know it. It means the state is interfering with the freedom of the press and it must not be permitted. It's the thin end of a wedge. I think it's hysterical and silly myself, but they might get away with it because politicians are always scared of upsetting the media. The anti-regulation lobby's slippery slope argument conveniently ignores compelling evidence to the contrary that is on display every day on British television screens. The BBC, ITN, Sky News, Channel 4, all of the reporting they put out is already subject to statutory regulation. Yet no one can seriously make the case that television journalism in Britain is really restricted by the regulatory hand of government. When television was invented, there was a limited amount of spectrum on which channels could broadcast. Therefore, the government had to award a license to people who wanted to do it. It was also being beamed directly into people's rooms, and so it felt that actually there needed to be some form of state control. But it would represent a colossal restriction on what has always been a very free and rambunctious press in this country. 
I think it's important that we recognise that newspapers do have a different role. They are allowed to take more risks, they're allowed to be very partisan, they're allowed to investigate and they're allowed to often be in a very cheeky and some would say rude and aggressive way to pursue certain issues and I think that's vital to the overall ecology of the media in Britain. However, the idea that the broadcast media have been shackled by the fact that they are subject to more uh, tougher forms of regulation is of course a myth. The broadcast news media are not perfect, but the reason they're not perfect is not because they're subject to forms of regulation that the press want to avoid. It may be for a whole number of different reasons. As soon as we had commercial broadcasting, you can see pretty sensible regulation with absolutely no interference of any kind in journalistic output, how the news is covered. So we've got a long tradition of non-interference, even though it's within a statutory backed regulatory system. But the press, the printed media, is going mad at the thought that Leveson might put in a regulatory system. By indicating that he opposes Levison's proposal for statutory regulation, which his coalition partner Nick Clegg supports, Prime Minister Cameron is adopting a similar position to the news organisations the inquiry grilled him over. We should, I believe, be wary of any legislation that has the potential to infringe free speech and a free press. Justice Levison saw all those chummy text messages between Cameron and Murdoch editor Rebecca Brooks knew of his hiring of Brooks's colleague Andy Coulson as communications chief at 10 Downing Street, and Levison has followed the legal cases against both Brooks and Coulson now before the courts. It is as though David Cameron realizes he went all in on his relationship with Murdoch's News International and other papers, and has calculated that with an election on the horizon, it's too late to change that now. Cameron is in a very precarious position politically. The newspapers themselves are lobbying quite hard. So I'm sure Cameron will be very cognizant of the fact that people will be lobbying him. And he'll also be recognized that he has to live in a world where the media matters. He'll also be conscious that this is a very messy situation. It's a political mess, it's a media mess. And the best thing for him to do would be to be very even handed, to accept something in broad terms and let the details be uh, established outside of his control. There's been obviously incredible pressure, especially from the newspapers, who really fear that there will be political and commercial consequences for them and the power that they have if statute regulation comes through. So we have seen at times quite a frantic and I'd argue occasionally self-defeating campaign which I think has been a little hysterical at times and has since shown the kind of faults that make those politicians want to control the press in the first place. Cameron will feel that if he carries through statutory underpinning, the media will be against him, Murdoch will be against him, the government's already unpopular, and I think he'll find a way of backing off. I've got a real fear that we'll get political cowardice, not a judgment about what's right, but lots of MPs and party leaders fearful to vote in a way that would upset the press because they think they'll then attack them on other things. As for Justice Levison, he says his work is done. The ball moves back into the politicians' court. They must now decide who guards the guardians. Levison left without taking questions. As the papers reported, he is off to Australia to deliver some speeches and to take a holiday in the sun, if not from the sun. Our Global Village Voice is now on the Levison Report and the future of journalism in the United Kingdom. Lord Justice Leveson gave far more detail in the way he'd like to see this implemented than I expected, which was very, very interesting. But the press are probably not going to like it because any form of legal underpinning makes them all terribly upset and, and edgy. If you actually just scrape away this, the surface here, it's really not bad at all. It's not actually inhibiting the press in any way. It is just setting up a body which is legally backed in order to make them behave themselves. What is so terrible about that? I, I think there's going to be a lot of uh, commentary and interest both this week and in subsequent subsequent weeks as to the practicalities of how one would police the media. Clearly there's been a lot of distaste and dissatisfaction regarding some of those methods, but in a free society we have to allow the press to investigate things in a way which uncovers uh, maladministration, which uncovers crime, which sometimes is a very difficult thing to do. So there has to be that balance and clearly 
Uh, Leveson is a, is a turning point, a new chapter in the relationship we have with the media. We're always looking for new faces for the program. If you'd like to share your thoughts on the news media as one of our Global Village voices, just get in contact with us on Facebook and Twitter where we will let you know what stories we're working on. Or you can just get in touch with us via email at listeningpost at aljazeera.net. And don't forget our free video podcast on iTunes. Just go looking for the Listening Post, Al Jazeera English, and you'll find us there. Time now for Listening Post News Bites. Syria remains the most deadly country in the world to be a journalist, and picking a side is no guarantee of safety. Basel Youssef, a reporter on Syrian state TV, was shot and killed outside his home in Damascus, November 21st. According to the channel he worked for, Youssef had been kidnapped and threatened over the past few months. The Syrian Observatory for Human Rights said that Youssef was killed by rebel forces. Another journalist, Mohammed Al-Khal, was killed in the shelling of the eastern city of Deir al-Zur, November 25th. Al-Khal worked for the pro-rebel Sham News Network. Just prior to those two incidents, a Turkish cameraman was released after nearly three months in government custody. Junayet Unal, who was working for the U.S.-funded Arabic-language al Hura TV, was arrested in Aleppo. Doing a certain kind of journalism in Brazil has its perils as well. A website editor who wrote critically about the abuse of power has become the latest reporter to be killed there. Gunman shot Eduardo Carvalho several times outside his home in the southwestern border state of Mato Grosso do Sul. On the day of his murder, Carvalho had posted a story on his site, Ultima Ora News, accusing the police of abuse of authority. Carvalho's murder is the latest in a series of attacks against critical voices in the Brazilian media. This year, at least four journalists have been killed there. The U.S.-based Committee to Protect Journalists put the problem into context. The period since President Dilma Rousseff took office, it said, has been the deadliest two years for the Brazilian press since the CPJ began documenting cases in 1992. Authorities must take action now to guarantee that journalists can report without fear of reprisal by bringing journalists murderers to justice and breaking the deadly cycle of impunity. Then there's the journalist who got away in Pakistan. Hamid Mir is the host of a political talk show on GOTV. A bomb was reportedly found under his car in Islamabad, spotted by one of Mir's guards. The bomb was then diffused with the whole episode unfolding live on GOTV's air. The Pakistani Taliban has reportedly claimed responsibility for the bomb. The assassination attempt is the first high-profile attack on a Pakistani journalist since the Taliban threatened the media following their critical coverage of the shooting of the teenage girl Malala Yousafzai back in October. Mir was one of many journalists who spoke out against that shooting, and that's rare in an industry that treads very carefully when criticizing the Taliban. According to the Paris-based Press Freedom Group, Reporters Without Borders, eight journalists have been killed since the start of the year. None of those cases has resulted in a conviction which is par for the course in Pakistan. The official newspaper of the Chinese Communist Party has egg on its face after running a report from a U.S. news outlet without realizing that that outlet, The Onion, deals in fake news. The article declared that the winner of its 2012 Sexiest Man Alive competition was, in fact, the North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. Oblivious, the People's Daily ran a photo gallery of the leader on its website quoting the Ungan's report, which fawned. Blessed with an air of power that masks an unmistakable cute and cuddly side, Kim made this newspaper's editorial board swoon with his impeccable fashion sense, chic short hairstyle, and, of course, that famous smile. This is the second time that we know of that a Chinese newspaper has been duped by the onion. Back in 2002, one of Beijing's biggest tabloids published as news a fake story about the U.S. Congress wanting a new building and that it might leave Washington to get one. Some things just get lost in translation. We're dusting one off from the vault. This is a piece that we've shown you once before, one that we think is worth a second look. I came across an old black and white American newsreel from the 1940s. Newsreels were short little news films from the pre-television era that were played in cinemas before the feature film. They were the trailers of their day. This newsreel was made by Encyclopedia Britannica, which was the Wikipedia of its day. The film was part of a post-World War II series called Your Life Work, and it introduces the audience to the inside of a newspaper, what it's like in a newsroom. We thought it might be fun to show the newsreel to a few journalists and get their thoughts on what has changed in journalism over the decades and a few things that have not. First, though, the same disclaimer that I read the first time around. The opinions expressed in the newsreel about the role of women in journalism do not in any way reflect the views of The Listening Post or Al Jazeera. <laughs> The 
alphabet has only 26 letters. With these 26 magic symbols, however, millions of words are written every day. Millions of words to report the world in newspapers. I'm not sure it was ever seen as a great honor to be a reporter by anything other than aspiring journalists and journalists themselves. If you want a fascinating life, this is still the best job. If you visit the newsroom of a daily paper, you will find it very similar to any busy office, although arranged somewhat differently. When I went to work for the Houston Chronicle, it looked very much like this newsroom, except it had cigarette burns in all the carpeting, and there was the faint smell of whiskey. What I remember most about my first newsroom was lots of people banging away on typewriters. There's an amazing amount of noise there was in those places, and people talking to each other. It was very hard for you to make it as a reporter if you didn't smoke and drink. But it was almost imperative that you did one of the two. The newsroom is the heart of a newspaper. It really makes you realize how much has changed because the three main things that we rely on as journalists these days to get by are completely absent from that room. Television screens, computers, and mobile phones. The thing to remember is that that may be 1940, but if you'd been doing this in 1980, the story would not essentially have changed at all. Now, as everything is all singing, all dancing, in the building we're in, the Guardian building, the newsroom effectively stretches about three quarters of a mile, absolutely all open pan with little rabbit hutches that people can rush into and hide if they need to. Reporters on beats are known as outside men, since they work away from the office most of the time, gathering news. I haven't been inside a newsroom for probably about a year now. I'd say that newsrooms are less maybe the heart of an operation, more like the brains of an operation. But the emotion, the blood, the sweat, the tears, I think that's all in the field now. They're showing us here the tear gas canisters. You don't have to have an office and you don't all need to be there. So in a sense, distance and proximity is of no relevance any longer. This reporter is in a hurry. He is going to cover a fire. The reporter must be able to think clearly and quickly, and he must get his facts accurately. Assignments of this type may keep the reporter out in bad weather for many hours of hard, tiresome work. This is what it looks like when the wind is gusting 144 miles an hour. She throws more wind at you! The press associations gather important news and relay it to hundreds of newspapers over special telegraph wire services. What's changed dramatically since the internet is that it comes from everywhere. It comes from, from, from tweets, it comes from blogs, it comes from just members of the public emailing in. If those journalists from that film in the 1940s were to actually look at the way in which we get our news these days, they'd be appalled. I mean, there they are reading reams and reams of paper and, and wires, and there we are getting our information basically in 140 characters. The financial section is reported by experts in the field of business, and they must be extremely accurate, for even a slight error has been known to influence the financial market. I can think of one of Britain's most prominent television journalists who to this day still doesn't understand capitalism, and he's probably not the only one who's got very strong views on business without quite understanding how it works. This is what happens. This is what happens. If their stock tips and recommendations don't turn out, well, it's kind of a shrug of the shoulders, what can you say? I mean business! But if he happens to hit on two or three, everybody says, boy, that guy's a genius when it comes to investing. Women find it difficult to compete with men in general reporting jobs. So girls who want to be successful in journalism should prepare for work in the special women's department. Home decoration, child care, gardening and cookery, meal planning suggestions, menus, recipes, and attractive ways of arranging the table. I can honestly tell you that I've never done a report on recipe ideas, and I don't have the first clue about home decor. They're saying the people demand the overthrow of the regime. When you look at the frontline badass journalism that's being done, is often being done these days by women. We were being ambushed. The sound that you're hearing now is a of a machine gun. There's so many bullets flying around. The there. competition isn't just with men, the competition is very much between women themselves in the field. The editorial writer must be able to write on many subjects. 
but instead of merely reporting news, he analyzes it and explains its meaning, often expressing his personal opinion. Oh, yes. Oh, no, I said it wasn't yes. good investment. Please Don't give me any of that. We just heard the words. What are you, Let's what talk. are you, that, you didn't Let's say that? You want me to play it again for you? He must reason accurately and fairly. <laughs> Qualifications of a newspaper worker are not easy ones to fill. Check your qualifications. Chelsea Clinton is joining NBC News as a special correspondent. The potential for a few flurries over Balmoral. Who the hell wrote this script? <laughs> when I look back, uh, some of the most brilliant reporters I ever came across had no qualifications of any sort. They were just brilliant. And some of the most useless reporters I ever came across were sort of Oxford PhDs in, in 25 different languages or whatever. Education and journalism, though they are on nodding acquaintance, don't really sort of coexist. If you don't like to write, you won't be happy in journalism. But there's a real thrill in seeing your own byline over a story when it's in print. And there's always the feeling that you'll try to make the next story just a little better. The excitement of seeing your name in print, that's the truest statement in the whole film. It's as true today as it ever was. <laughs> More Global Village Voices now on that 1940s newsreel and how it compares to journalism today. I thought it was kind of funny that when the guy goes out to cover the deadly fire, all they talk about is how exciting it is to cover it and how great it is to see his byline in the paper. Nothing about how dangerous the fire is or how horrible it must be for the people involved. And I think that attitude actually is kind of similar to journalism today, but instead of bylines, we just talk more about retweets. The outdated video shows a newsroom of reporters, and they're all specialized to different tasks. What's changed since 1940 is that journalists are no longer being specialized in these tasks, but they're rather being consolidated into one-size-fits-all reporters who gather the information, compile a story, and then present it to the audience all by themselves. And it's still hard to tell if this is streamlining the art of journalism or if it's merely a result of harsh corporate cost-cutting in newsrooms today. Finally, last year it became one of the most recognizable public squares in the world and it's a dateline once again. Tens of thousands of Egyptians are occupying Tahrir Square. This time they're protesting new President Mohamed Morsi's recent decree in which he placed himself above the judiciary and led some of his critics to say that Morsi is acting less like a president, more like a pharaoh. We came across an online video called Wake Up Morsi. It was made back in October to mark the first 100 days of the Morsi presidency. And this video suggested that the warning signs were already there that a power grab was underway. Wake Up Morsi is our web video of the week. We'll see you next time at the Listening Post. <laughs> Yeah, Morsi!